Well, I don't know about you folks, but I believe I could worship like that all day long. Thank you, Ben, choir, praise team. You guys do such a great job. Well, I'm going to do a little, little bit of a shift here, I guess. Um, I, you guys probably know, most of you at least know, I'm a baseball fan, right? And uh, the Braves, I'm a big Braves fan. In case you didn't know, they won the World Series last year, in case you missed that. Um, but I have a baseball trivia question for you. has nothing to do with the Braves, just to see if anybody recognizes this name. What's it? No, no, that would be too easy. Clint Courtney. Anybody ever heard of him? I don't see a single hand. Clint Courtney. Well, that's because he's not, you're not going to find him at Cooperstown, the Hall of Fame. If you go looking for him there, you're not going to find him. He wasn't uh, famous in his own time, nor in his own mind, actually. Um, he's not very well known and wasn't even really at the time except for a few diehard fans. He was with a couple of teams, but he played the most for the Baltimore Orioles in the 50s. He was a catcher. Again, he only played for a few years. Uh, he wasn't known very well. Uh, you've heard people talk about baseball players making difficult plays look easy. Well, this guy made easy plays look difficult, but he, he, he managed to make them. He wasn't graceful behind the plate, but he, he earned the nickname Scrap Iron. And as a catcher, you can imagine why. He was tough as scrap iron. I mean, nothing seemed to phase this guy. Catchers take a beating. Well, for whatever reason, maybe it was because he wasn't very athletic, uh, Courtney, he, he received more than most. I mean, he was constantly getting hit by batters with the bat. Uh, he, was, he, would take, he took many foul balls off his elbows. I mean, more often than not, after he would get, somebody would foul off a pitch or he'd get hit by a pitch, he would be doubled over in pain. He would take a second, collect himself. He would get up or back in his catcher's position and hit his mitt a couple of times and then motion for the pitcher to bring another one. I mean, he just kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back. He, broke, he didn't break any records, but he broke a lot of bones. But he was tough, and he kept coming, and the, he, he earned the respect of the players, and he earned the respect of the fans, and he even had sort of like a cult following because this guy just wouldn't quit. Even though he took a beating over and over and over again, he kept coming back. You know, that's a pretty good analogy for life. Sometimes life is going to beat you down. Sometimes you're going to get bumps. You're going to get bruises. Spiritually, you're going to get a few broken bones. But the question is, will we, as followers of Christ, endure or not? You know, we've been in this series now. This is week 11. This has been a pretty long series. Brother Caleb's going to finish it up for us next week. But this series is all about faith in action. It's called Taking It to the Streets. And the theme of our series is faith that is real works practically in a person's life. Real faith is faith that works. It's faith in action. James, the book of James, which we've been going through, is all about living out your faith. Not that works save us, but true salvation is shown in our works. It'll be seen in our lives. And it won't just be seen over a period of time and then not for the rest of your life. True faith works out through the rest of your life. Our lives should be defined by spiritual fruit, spiritual growth, and we should see that, not that we're perfect, we're not, none of us are, but there's progress, there's growth consistently over the course of your life. Which means if we're going to make it, we're going to have to endure some pretty tough stuff along the way, right? And, and some of you know more of what I'm talking about than even I do. Some of you have been through some incredibly trying circumstances, but we all are going to go through trying circumstances in our lives. If you haven't, you know, I can't promise you what the future holds, and I don't mean to depress you this morning, but one thing I can promise you is that you are going to experience trials in your life. But there's good news for all of us. When we look at James chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12 today. We're just going to walk through that together today, all right? And we look at those first 12 verses, we see James talks about two different groups of people, and it, he continues uh, with some of what he's discussed before. He, he talks about the rich. And he talks about the poor. 
In particular, what we see happening here is that those who are wealthy are using their wealth and their influence to oppress the poor. So the, the poor are going through some difficult circumstances. But here is, here is the good news, or here is the reason for hope, one of the reasons for hope for those who are being oppressed, is that even though it seems like the whole world is against them, it seems like no one cares about their oppression, it seems like nobody's there to defend them because the rich have control of the courts as well, God sees it all, and everyone will be held accountable for what they do, both the good and the bad. And he talks about that as in our passage that we're going to look at this morning. Two truths that I want us to come away with, that I believe James wants us to come away, his readers to come away with, that we can apply to our lives. The first is this, number 3223, be sure your sins will find you out. That's true for all of us, right? Our sins, we think we may get away with something. And in this world, we may in fact get away with something. But God sees it and will be held accountable for it either in this life or in eternity depending on the condition of our hearts and salvation. Let's look at verses 1 through 6 of James chapter 5. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming to you. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasure in the last days. Look, the pay that you withheld from your workers who mowed your fields cries out and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous who does not resist you. So James was concerned here about the selfishness of those who were rich and advised them. He told them, you need to weep and you need to wail because here's what's going to come. Unless there's a change, here's what's coming. So what exactly was going on? For, well, for one thing, the first three verses tell us they were hoarding their wealth. They were hoarding their wealth. This shows the condition of their hearts. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy in and of itself. I mean, wealthiness is not an evil thing by itself. But it is wrong to store up wealth when you owe money to people who are working for you, or you owe money to somebody else for whatever reason. And that's what these wealthy individuals were doing. These rich men are hoarding grain, they're holding gold, hoarding gold and garments. And, and what's sad about this is not 10 years after James writes this, the city of Jerusalem falls. Just 10 years, Jerusalem falls to the Romans, and all of this wealth that these individuals are hoarding is taken by the Romans. They're hoarding it for that. That's the future. They don't know that, but we can look back and see that. It shows the silliness of hoarding all of this wealth. Jesus said this to the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go and sow your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard that, he went on his way grieving because he had many possessions. It wasn't that he, his having possessions that condemned him, it was the fact that he could not give up those possessions. He relied solely on those possessions. Those possessions were his God, and he couldn't let it go. He couldn't, he couldn't submit to the Lord and give everything to him and trust him with everything. So what does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? That's what the Bible tells us we should do. Jesus says that we should do. Well, to store up treasures in heaven means that we use all that we have on this earth, ourselves, our stuff, everything, we use it for the glory of God. And we submit it to him. And we use it for his kingdom. God is the owner of everything, and we are stewards. So look at this. This is one way to look at it. When we submit to God's will... And we use what he gives us to serve him, then even the things that we have become treasures, not because of their value on earth, but because we can use them to invest in eternity. When we are determined to use everything that we are and everything that we have for the glory of God, he can take even the most insignificant things and use them to further his kingdom if we'll give it to him. 
if we'll submit to him. Something to think about here. The rich were not using their own wealth in any way for God's glory. Okay, that's obvious here. But here's the other part of this that's so sad. Because they are withholding wages from the people who are working for them. Not even their workers had the opportunity to use that wealth for God's glory. Nobody was using what was there for God's glory because the rich were hoarding it and they refused to use it. We need to be faithful to use what God gives us for the good of others. Rich men, the rich men James is talking to, they were feeding themselves on their riches and starving to death spiritually. That verse, the Greek word here, uh, talking about being fattened, it, it pictures a cattle that's being fattened just for the purpose of slaughter. And really that's their destiny here. They're, they're, they're looking, their, their future is punishment. Their future is pain because they are taking all that they have, they are hoarding it instead of using it for God's glory. And one day all earthly riches are going to, to vanish. You know, there's a huge difference between enjoying what God has given me, which we all should. We should enjoy the things that God allows us to be stewards over. And he wants us to enjoy those things. But there's a huge difference between enjoying those things and hoarding those things just for the purpose of building up wealth or, or trying to create some sort of security from those things because, again, they'll vanish. Verses 2 and 3, the grain will rot, gold will rust, garments will become moth-eaten. Everything on this earth will one day pass away. And it's a mistake. It's, it's tempting for all of us because... You know, wealth, things, I can see it, I can touch it, I can depend on it. But it's a huge mistake to draw security from those things instead of drawing security from God my Father, from our relationship to Him through Jesus Christ, the salvation that He provides. That's the only true security we can have in life because everything in this life one day is going to be gone. And misuse riches also destroy our character. The poison of wealth has infected these, one person said in my study. And these people are being eaten alive. That's the picture that we get here. 1 Timothy 6.10, you know, money itself is not e evil. It's neutral. It's just a, a thing, a material thing. But 1 Timothy 6.10 tells us the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, there, there's a story, John G. Wendell, he and his sisters were some of the most wealthy people that the world's ever known, of their time especially. And they had received this huge inheritance from their parents, but they wouldn't, use, they wouldn't spend any of it. John Wendell was so focused on hoarding this wealth. Listen, he had six sisters. He convinced five of his six sisters not to get married so that their wealth wouldn't be compromised. I mean, that, that guy's got some influence, right? Or had some influence. Well... It's estimated, well, fi finally, when, when everybody had passed away, including the last sister, they discovered that at the time, her estate was valued at somewhere around $100 million. $100 million. And here's the catch. They figured out that this sister, they lived in this house. They never spent any money. They never used this money for anything. They just hoarded it and hoarded it and hoarded it. And she had one dress that she had made herself and wore that same dress for 25 years. Never used any of this money. Now, here's the sad part. They all passed away. Guess where that money was? It was exactly where they had put it. It never moved. They left, they're gone, the money was still there. Huge lesson. One day, you and I will leave this earth, and everything that we have is going to be left behind. So the question is, what are we doing with it now while we have the opportunity? It's okay to enjoy what you have, but are we using it for God's glory? If you only store up treasures in earth, on earth, that's exactly where they will remain when you leave this earth, when I leave this earth. And James shows us the futility of that. He also shows us that the sins of these oppressors, these wealthy who are taking advantage of their workers, is going to come back to haunt them. You know, the Bible doesn't discourage, again, being wealthy, but the Bible does condemn uh, le illegally acquiring wealth and using it for illegal purposes, which is what's happening these rich are being selfish. They were holding back wages from their workers. Now, these workers, they didn't have any contracts necessarily, but they, the wealthy had agreed to hire these workers and had agreed to pay them for work that they did when they accomplished it. The workers had accomplished the work that they agreed to do, and the wealthy said, you know what, I changed my mind. I'm not going to pay you. I don't have to. 
And the reason they didn't have to is because they controlled the courts. So even if the workers tried to sue them, it didn't matter. They had influence. They had bribed the court officials so they could do whatever they wanted and and get away with it. So the law of the day didn't didn't charge them, but God's law, we see in Deuteronomy chapter 24, God had given definite instructions for workers and laborers. Verses 14 and 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 24, do not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether one of your Israelite brothers or one of the resident aliens in a town in your land. doesn't matter whether they're Israelites or not. Don't oppress them. Very clear, right? You are to pay him his wages each day before the sun sets because he is poor and depends on them. Otherwise, he will cry out to the Lord against you and you will be held guilty. So these are Jews that James is writing to. This is the law that God had established. The new covenant didn't abolish this. They should have been treating their workers rightly. There was no excuse for what they were doing. But they had hired these laborers, and they had agreed to pay them a specific amount. They had failed to do it. They had withheld, and the tense of that verb withheld, in the original Greek, indicates that the laborers, would not only were they withholding them for a time, it indicates that they would never receive those wages. These, these wealthy had no intent on paying the workers for the work that they had done. And they were controlling in the courts, as I had said. So these guys had no hope. They were being oppressed, and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. But, as James tells us, judgment was coming for these men. He not only saw present judgment, their wealth was going to decay, their character was being destroyed because they were not living as God intended and conducting themselves that way, but there was a future judgment coming. Christ would be the judge. And his judgment will be righteous. Hebrews 9.27 And just as it is appointed for people to die once after this comes judgment. We all, we all will face judgment. There will be the judgment of the righteous, those who are in Christ. We will be held accountable for our actions. But thankfully Jesus will be there to say he is mine or she is mine and my blood covers their sins. But there will also be the judgment of the wicked, those who are not in Christ who will be held accountable for their actions, and Jesus will not stand for them because they didn't put their faith and trust in Christ on earth. And these wealthy, they will be held accountable. James is saying it'll happen. There were poor people in the congregation who who could have been helped. There were workers who deserved their wages. And sad to say, in a few years, all of this wealth would be gone. But those who had what they had were not using it to help others. And James, he's not condemning rich wealth. He's not condemning rich people. He's condemning the wrong use of riches. And rich people who use their wealth as a weapon to tear down or to destroy instead of a tool to build God's kingdom and to help others. And there will be consequences. Put it simply, I mean, they would, they would face consequences. What goes around comes around. I mean, they're going to receive everything they've dished out is what James is telling them. Even though the poor are being oppressed, though, seems pretty bleak, but James gives them hope. He gives them assurance. And that's where we see our second truth. Your sins will find you out, but be sure the Savior is going to strengthen his children. James says, be strong, persevere, don't give up. Can't do it on their own, though. They need supernatural strength. Let's look at verses 7 through 9. Of chapter 5. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until he receives the earthly and the late rains? You, you also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. That word patient, we don't like that word, do we? Nobody likes patient. Nobody... Don't pray for patience because God might give it to you. Well, we need patience. And that's what James is saying is be patient here. And that word means to stay put and stand fast when you'd like to run away. You ever face a situation where you'd like to just run away? Well, James is saying, I know you'd like to run away. You'd like to get rid of all of this, leave all of this behind. They don't have a way out, but that's what they'd like to do. But he's saying, hey, he's saying, stand put, stay, don't run away, be patient. God will strengthen you. You know, he uses the analogy of a farmer, and a farmer has to have patience, right? 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a farmer, never been a farmer, but what I know about farmers is that they have to have patience. They have to be long-suffering. Crops don't grow overnight. And you have to wait on rain. You can't control the weather. You have to, you, you just gotta, you, you're subject to the elements. So you have to have patience. You got to be patient with, patient with the seasons too, right? I mean, crops, the growth of crops is dependent upon what season it is. And, and you know, if you're a farmer in Alabama, it could be a different season every day, I'm sure, right? The weather around here, you just never know. So you're, you're subject to the seasons. It takes time for plants to grow. But it's worth the wait when the harvest comes in, right? It's worth the wait. The patience pays off. And James, what he's doing here is picturing us as spiritual farmers who have to be patient, who are subject to the different elements, the seasons of life, the, 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 the whims of others at times. You know, whatever happens, sometimes we can't control it. The truth is we have no control. All right. Any control that we have is really just an illusion because life is unpredictable. There's any number of things that could happen, but we have to be patient. We have to trust in the Lord. We have to live our lives looking for the spiritual harvest in our lives. Because God, here's, here's the lesson that we need to learn, that we need to hold on to, is that God is using everything that happens to us to produce a harvest in our lives. And that harvest is that one day we will be like Jesus Christ. One day, all the work he's doing on us, all the good things, the bad things, he uses it all to, to shape us and to form us into the image of his Son. And one day, if we remain faithful, we will see him face to face and get from him those words that we all should long for, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the harvest, is that we will be as we were intended to be when we were created. When man was created, he was perfect without sin, and then sin entered the world by man's choice and affected all of that. And we've been living with that ever since, with our broken lives, our broken bodies, this broken world. But Jesus Christ entered this broken world, gave his life, paid the price for our sins, was, died, was buried, was raised on the third day. And for those of us who know him, who trust in him, have the promise that he, we will one day be as we were intended to be. Perfect. In the presence of God for all of eternity. If we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For salvation. That's the harvest. That is what we are waiting for. And he wants the fruit of the Spirit, as the scriptures say, to grow. And the only way sometimes he can do that is through trials. And listen, it's tough, it's difficult, I know. But he uses those trials to shape us. And we grow through trials in ways that we can't grow when times are good because it increases our dependence. He encouraged. These farmers, or these, these oppressed, like farmers, to keep working and to keep waiting. He encouraged them to get along with each other. Farmers usually tend to get along with each other because they depend on each other. I mean, the farmers are notorious for helping one another. And that's what he has in mind here. He's saying you need each other. You need to help each other. Don't be disagreeable. Don't criticize one another. Get along with one another. Depend on each other to get through this difficult time. Don't be... Impatient. Impatience with God often leads to impatience with God's people. And it's a sin that we need to guard against as God's people. If we don't, we might just miss the harvest. Now look at verses 10 through 12. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or earth or with any other oath, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no, so that you won't fall under judgment. So first of all, verses 10 and 11, we have the, the promise that as we patiently endure, we will experience God's mercy. It's hard to wait, it's hard to endure, but there's mercy available from God. He uses the Old Testament prophets. When, and Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, used the Old Testament 
prophets as an example of victory over persecution. These folks were being persecuted. They were being oppressed. And so he looks, he uses the prophets. And the encouragement here from these prophets was, this doesn't sound like encouragement, but it is, okay? When you're going through difficulty, the Old Testament prophets, the faithful ones, were exactly where God wanted them to be, doing exactly what God called them to do, yet they still suffered. I mean, just do a little study through the the history of the prophets and how many of them were actually listened to and were successful in what they did. Okay? Some were, but many times... They were ignored, not just ignored, they were persecuted because of the message that they were delivering and those in power didn't want to hear that message. And so what James is saying is these guys were exactly where they were supposed to be doing exactly what God called them to do and they were still suffering. So don't be discouraged. And, and, and this reminds us that, that God helped them to endure so it reminds us that God is with us and he's there for us and he cares for us even when we're going through trials and difficulties. It's been said that the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. And God's grace truly is sufficient. You know, many of the prophets had to endure incredible trials and sufferings, not only at the hands of unbelievers, but at the hands of God's own people. Believers. Why do believers go through trials? Well, I don't know all the answers to that question. Let me just preface what I'm about to say. I, I, there are some things that happen I don't have an explanation for. I wish I did, but I don't. I'm like, God, I don't understand, except that we live in a broken world, and bad things happen in a broken world. But one reason we go through trials is to prove to unbelievers that our lives back up what we say we believe if we're faithful in the midst of those trials. Because when we're put to the test, when we're put under fire, we have to trust God and endure. It's easy to endure when things are good. It's difficult to endure when things are bad. But if we do, by the power and strength of God, it proves to an unbelieving world that we really are who we say we are, and we really believe what we say we believe. God uses it. That's one of the ways God uses it. Our patience in times of suffering is a testimony to others around us. James says we count as blessed those who have endured. We look back, we see the prophets, we see those who have endured before us, and we consider them blessed because of the finished product when it was all said and done. But the truth is you can't persevere unless there's a trial in your life. God had to give Paul a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. You get the idea that without a thorn in the flesh, Paul would have been even more arrogant than he appears to be at times. He, I don't believe he was arrogant in necessarily in a sinful manner, but he sure was bold, right? So you could see how that would lead to the persecution of Christians before, the enthusiasm, the tenacity. God certainly harnessed it and channeled it for his glory, but without God keeping him in check, you can imagine what, that would have, what would have happened. And I don't know what, nobody knows what Paul's thorn was, but I believe with all my heart that God gave him that thorn to keep him humble. And without it, he would not have been able to depend on God as well as he did in those times of beating, in those times of imprisonment, in those times of suffering that he did for the gospel. He taught Paul to depend on him, and he uses our sufferings in the same way. But James tells us that there's a blessing after we've endured, and he uses the example of Job. Now think about it. The story of Job, I won't go into it, obviously, but we know that Job suffered. He was persecuted. He was the most righteous man of his day. Satan goes to God and says, he wouldn't be righteous if he, he, everything's good for him now. If you let me uh, just torture him a little bit, he'll deny you, and God allows Satan to do that. But the thing about that we have to understand about the story of Job is that we read it, we've got the backstory, we see what's going on behind the scenes. Job had no clue what was going on behind the scenes when all of that stuff happened to him. He lost his family, he lost his wealth, he lost everything, even his health, to the point to where his friends said, hey, this is because of your sin, that was the popular belief of the day, Right? based on a covenant that God had made with his people, that if they were faithful, that God would, would, would bless them. So everybody believed that. He, he suffered so much that his own wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? How would you like your wife to tell you that if you're going through something difficult? You just need to die. 
You just need to curse God and get it over with. But yet Job, in the midst of all of it, said this. Job 13, 15, even if he kills me, though he slay me, I will trust him. I will still defend my ways before him. See, God made a covenant with, Deut- with the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 11 that he had blessed them. So the, the reasoning of the day was, hey, if you're suffering, it's because you've sinned. That's why Job's friends told him that. And I'm sure the readers in James that James is writing to believed, hey, we're suffering. We must have done something wrong. And James is saying, no, think about Job. He had done nothing wrong, yet he still suffered. You've done nothing wrong. Stay faithful. God sees you. He hears you. He knows where you are. But if God is so merciful, we're talking about merciful, why didn't he protect Job? Why didn't he protect these people from this oppression? And again, there are some mysteries of God that we don't know. But this we know. In the story of Job, God was glorified. Job was purified through his circumstances. And this simple truth, we have to learn endurance. We have to learn dependence. The truth is, if there's nothing to endure, you cannot learn endurance. So God uses those trials. And the believers that James is writing to here, they, this meant that, that some of their trials were not a result of their sin. It was simply because of satanic opposition. Now, we, can't, we tend to blame things on Satan that we shouldn't. We do things, we cause things ourselves, right? But some things, rightfully so, we can blame on Satan because there's spiritual warfare going on. This whole unseen realm, there's this warfare going on. And that's what James is saying is that there is opposition to your faithfulness. But God was in control. And and ultimately, God was going to win that that battle. So what's the answer? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for all circumstances. My power is perfected in weakness, so I will... Most gladly boast all the more, Paul said, about my weakness, his thorn in the flesh, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So when you find yourself in the furnace, in the fire, first of all, remember God has his hand on the thermostat. When you find yourself in the furnace, go to the throne of grace, and God will give you the grace that you need. Then, as we patiently endure, we have to maintain righteousness. Verse 12 talks about Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no mean no, so that you won't fall under judgment. Swearing is really talking about speaking oaths. So why does he talk about this in the context of suffering? Well, it's easy to say things you don't mean when you're hurting, right? You'll promise anything just to get out of that pain. And he's reminding them, hey, don't, don't, don't make oaths that are unnecessary. Don't say things that you don't mean. Be consistent. Be faithful. True Christian character requires few words. If you're a true Christian with integrity, then all you have to do is say yes or no, and people are going to believe you. Jesus warned us that anything more than this is a form, or is from the evil one, rather. One of the the the, the Purposes of suffering is to build character. And he's just reminding them, maintain your character, even in the midst of difficulty. Because God has a plan, and it's bigger than anything you can see. Now, before we pull up these pictures, Gil, do the cl- make sure the close-up, the zoomed-in one is first, okay? It'll ruin the whole thing. No pressure, but it'll ruin the whole thing. There you go. Can anybody tell me what that is? Any guesses? What? I still can't hear you. A welding helmet, okay, good guess. Wrong, but good guess. Blurry, Blurry it is, yeah. It's because it's really zoomed in. Anybody else? Filing cabinet, okay, good guess. A hyphen, good guess, I guess. I don't know. If it's wrong, is it a good guess? I don't know. Anybody else want to guess? A rectangle, that is true, okay. All right, anybody else? Mail slot, okay. Anyone else? Okay, could, could potentially, but no, that's not it. All right. Everybody give up? You want to see? Everybody wants to see what it is now, right? All right, let's see the other one. That's what it is. It was the door handle on that car. 
Pretty simple, right? How could you guys not get that? Why couldn't you guess that? Say it again. Thank you, Gary. That's right. When it's up close like that, you don't have a clue what it is. And we could have guessed all day. Maybe somebody would have eventually gotten it right. But based on the guesses, I'm, I'm thinking probably not, okay? <laughs> you didn't have the full picture. Man, when life is in your face, when you're hurting, when you're suffering, you, you, you won't have all the answers as to why. When it's challenging, when it's difficult... When you're questioning God, why? And listen, Job, he said he still questioned God, why? And, and God basically told him, I'm God, and you're not. I mean, there are times where we don't understand, okay? But what we have to rest in is, first of all, the grace of God is sufficient. And if you'll depend on him, it won't be, to, be easy, but he will get you through. There'll still be pain, there'll still be hurt. Nothing changes that. But his grace is sufficient. The second thing is that God sees the big picture. We only see what's right in front of us. And he's doing something greater than we can fathom. And even if that suffering never ends in this life, one day, if you are a child of God, if you are in Christ, one day you will experience the glory of heaven where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no death, there is no dying. Only Jesus, his glory, perfection, all that we could ever think we need it or want for all of eternity. Trust in Christ, depend on his grace, and endure in his strength. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promise of eternity. And when life gets tough, when we suffer, when we experience trials, we can, if we trust in you and remain faithful, we can have that eternal perspective looking beyond the temporary looking beyond the here and now and see that you are building us for something that is so much better, so much more important than this life. You're building our character. You're building our endurance. You're increasing our faith. And you're molding us, even the bad things. You don't cause it, but you use it. And you use those things to strengthen us and to prepare us for your glory, for your kingdom, for your work. But we know, Father, that if we don't have a relationship with you through Jesus, there's no way we can endure on our own. There's no way we can endure in our strength. But God, if we trust in you, we can have hope that extends beyond this life. We can have the assurance of eternal life in you. And Father, I pray that if there's somebody here today who doesn't know you, who hasn't put their faith and trust in you, that today would be the day of salvation for them, that they would accept the invitation that you extend, that you offer to all who would turn to you in faith. Lord, just speak to us. Whatever we're going through, there are different individuals in this room, and, and everybody's dealing with something, some extremely difficult situations, but we're all dealing with something. So, Father, I pray that you would just help us, you, you would extend your grace and give us the strength to continue to endure by your power, by your strength, and for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Would you stand for this time of commitment? <laughs>